James Anderson, great to have you back. How are you, buddy? These are your days. Hey, Dale, how you doing? I'm doing good, James. So uh, <clears throat> feel good to see advances in the precious metals. Uh, uh, top of mind with what's going on here. Uh, background stories uh, that you're seeing in the arena. Uh, why don't you fill us in with, uh, you know, I haven't talked to you since this bull run began in uh, physical markets and miners, and um, it's almost become fashionable. <laughs> Not yet, I hope. Be Not a little bit. <laughs> Do you have anything to share on the screen, James? Yeah, I mean, let me, let me take you to my, uh, let's see here, so it's less, less boring. Uh, one sec. Okay. How things going in the mountains in Panama? Uh, good. A little windy today. A little windy. Yeah. Yeah. So I talked to Doug Casey about a month ago. He's in, uh, what's that country he's in? Not Argentina. But, uh, you know, you did what uh, he recommends people do besides being diversified financially into things like gold and uh, other hedges against, you know, what could unravel. Uh, he believed in also having political diversity, which means, you know, uh, uh, having, you know, another citizenship or another place to live in a different country to diversify, um, you know, politically where you live because, things change sure. and yeah so uh, that you, you know you're like uh, uh, the international man uh, <laughs> people that have done that that have left the states to carve out a different life for themselves outside the country and um, you have a you're hedged if things really unwind with like a stupid failure of to uh, raise the debt limit you know that might happen this time there's so much uh uh, hatred uh, between the parties and uh, tear, tear it down type of thing that, you know, we may go over the cliff. Do you think that's going to happen, James? In this environment? Are you with me? I think we lost James. I talked too long. You know, he was going in and out earlier, Dale. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I see him there, but it's, yeah. he's he's on mute. It's interesting. Is he muted? Uh, uh, no, I don't think he's. Yeah. Like I, I see him. I see. Hey, can you hear me now? There. Got you, I, yeah. There you got go. you now. What happened to you, bro? I tried to share the screen and uh, oh, okay. got, all, got all screwy. Can you see my Twitter? Yeah, we got it up there, James. All right, Thanks, cool. Blake. All right. Yeah. Sorry about that. So I think, uh, yeah, that's tough, Dale, just, just in general, living in a culture like that where it's political infighting every day. I think one of the hardest things about living in the United States is just the, the culture of, of, of not getting along and divide and conquer and having to deal with people who get sucked into that nonsense. Um, yeah. You know, that, that's just on your, on your soul, on your psyche. It's just a lot to deal with. And just to even have to hear, to get the eardrum abuse from one side or the other, like like yeah. I give a full, you know, like like it's gonna matter, you know, the, the, you know, I, I just think that's a huge waste of time. You, you know, you only have so much you can control. Uh, and energy, energy yeah. too. Yeah. So yeah. so yeah, I'm I'm happy not to be. That's like one of the probably when I hear people who are retired here, the older, you know, the boomer generation. That's one yeah. of the things they like the most about it is just not having to deal with that crap. Yeah. So, uh, and I agree, uh, you know, I mean, I'm not anywhere near that age, but I, I, I enjoy being around them because most of them don't do that. And, uh, and that's nice. So you have a nice expat commu uh, community in the yeah. mountains of Panama, huh? Yeah, there's a good one. And uh, I play golf with a lot of these old timers and they're good. You know, a lot of them are like ex-Vietnam vets and stuff. So they have some pretty good stories. Okay. All right. So uh, uh, interesting tweet. You talk about how. I hear I hear the the roosters. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We, we go we go organic out here, Blake. I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm, man. <laughs> <laughs> I hear an owl. 
You know, I mean, I don't get <laughs> roosters. Uh, you're in the country. I, sure. I hear an owl when I'm up here at four in the morning. So, um, so that, yeah. you know, that, that, uh, we'll talk about this, uh, Fred chart, but yeah. you also said, uh, had a tweet that silver trades two ways, slowly, gradually, then exponentially. Pretty so do you think that we're in this exponential part if we break 2450? No, I think, I think we're, we got to get past 30 and that's just still going to be a long fight. The 24 has been a huge consolidation channel the last month or two. Uh, and I know they don't want to give it up because next thing after 24 is 26. And then after yeah. 26, it's real quick to 30. And okay. so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of like one step, two step, that kind of thing. Tiptoeing toward 30, 30 is the, the break line. You get above 30 and it could chase this year, you know, to 40 and something like that. Could It can happen. Depending Any on chance. Could you think of anything that could uh, create for people that aren't on board? Uh, I am physical, uh, physical, but I let go of my mining shares uh, several weeks ago. Uh, any chance or can you think of anything that even if we get through this 2450 level that could create a buying opportunity in silver around 21? Can you think of yeah, anything you could, that you could you could have somehow? A magical bounce in the dollar index, perhaps. Okay. You know, okay. I mean, it, if you look technically <laughs> at it, it yeah. <laughs> but it, you know, it does look like it needs to, you know, at least bounce some. It's gone down massively, right? Yeah. At some yeah. point, you would think there would be some reason for it to bounce. Okay. Um, so some kind you know, of dollar low. Maybe we need to take out that big round number of a uh, par. That's what I was saying yeah. for the last few weeks to create the panic low for a bounce. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the but I mean, I look, it's one of those things. It's 21 versus 24 versus that's not going to matter. The fact is that you have some, you know, like yeah. it, 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 this is not a day trade. You're looking at this with a view of at least two to five years, I would say longer, uh, because what we're about to go through is going to be tumultuous. And by the end of it, silver should be valued a lot higher. And I don't care what the nominal fiat number is. It's really about what it can buy you in the real world, real goods and yeah. services in terms of asset classes, et cetera. So, yeah, yeah, you know. This is the long view, and so yeah. I know this is more of a trader kind of short-term podcast. But well, but it's, you know, I I feel that way about the physical I own. Yeah. I don't even think about it. You know, it's kind of like you know, yep. uh, some heavy stuff in the closet, right? <laughs> uh, but when I'm trading miners, I care more about it. Uh, I, I I I have to, except you know what? It it didn't pay to be tactical. So even there. Um, if I get another entry, I'm, it's one of the hardest things for me to do is to hold things a long time because I yeah. watch them too much. But uh, yeah, I think the mi I think it's embryonic in the miners. Even if you bought them here, in a few years, these prices will look cheap. But yeah, uh, tough to break the paradigm of looking for advantageous entries and exits. Uh, but something that um, I'm going to try to do um next uh, entry in the miners so, so so just one thing about the miners like you, you gotta know obviously miners totally different than bullion what right. you know they can underperform bullion and often do and have done for a long time yeah. so yeah uh, miners are fine if you select the right ones and and it's with gambling money and, and money that you can trade in and out of and take profits from and scalp with that's fine i just think that if you have you know say six eight ten miners and you call that your bullion position <laughs> You, you need yeah. you need to re recheck yourself because uh, I mean these charts I, I find very interesting. This is uh, the concept of a K wave winter is basically yeah. where you go through a monetary reset more or less. And it, since 2011, we've kind of been in that zone. And pretty much since 2010, 20, since 2008, I mean you, you probably saw the news. Central banks have been buying gold now, and they're admitting right. it finally at, to the tune of more than ever before prior to World War II. I mean, they'll show you this chart and you'll see this huge spike in 1967 and they'll say, oh, it's been the most gold they've been buying this year since 1967. And most people, it just flies over their head. 1967 was the year before the London gold pool price rate fell apart. And then gold went and did a 24 X in price. Okay. So yeah. we're now kind of doing the same kind of thing, but it's, we're shifting the floor underneath for a more multilateral, less unipolar world where gold has a lot more say in price discovery and commodity price discovery, et cetera. And so you have a situation now where you have so much gold that's flowed 
two government central banks since 2008. Watch what they do. Forget what they say. What they say is a lie most of the time. So, you know, watching what they do, you can see the record clip of net buyers that's been happening. I mean, it, it's it's setting up for a situation where, oh, surprise, you know, gold is now re into the monetary system. I mean, the, the IMF this past week had a, a had a some type of study. I forget the title of it. I have to go back to my my Twitter where it's basically like they, they more or less say gold is in a barber's relic and is it coming back into the international system with a question mark. And while the writing of, of it, I mean, it wasn't anything too insightful for someone as nerdy and, and into it as I am. They did have information that was interesting in terms of data and charts. And pretty much since 1999, you had the Eastern world buying gold physically yeah. and the central banks doing so in the Western world net sellers until about 2008 and then the Western world said, okay, we're not net sellers anymore. And they stopped selling out of their hordes. But what's happened is since 2008, you have those ETFs that have been the paper hands in the market, essentially where like, you know, Western GLD. Yeah. They'll buy GLD. They'll buy IEU. They'll buy SLV. And then when the, you know, per quarter to quarter, if it's not working out and you know, they're, they're trying to cut losses, they'll cut losses and there'll be a lot of physical that flows out of that to feed the Eastern markets. This is that chart that I was talking about where they'll show you 67 and they'll tell you, Oh, don't, don't worry. I mean, look at all these bars. Dun, 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 dun. Something's happening, yeah. right? I mean, they yeah. know that the thing totally imploded in 2008 and they've just been right. buying. And this doesn't include China. You know, just China has been doing it probably on the sneak at a much larger scale than even Russia. Russia has been probably much more transparent about what they've done in terms of buying gold. So anyways, the point well, is, well, they don't matter. have to buy it. They can just steal it from Ghana, right? Well, it's combination. Russia has the most gold reserves in Siberia in the world. I mean, they, they, they are yeah. going to be the number one miner of gold into the 2030s. It's just a matter. I mean, if they're not it already, they're second or third at the moment. And they're right on the cusp. I mean, it's between them, China and Australia. And, uh, so Russia eventually will be. Uh, this is that this is that IMF paper that was just published. You know, I mean, gold is an international reserve, so barbarous relic, no more question mark, right? Okay. Yeah. You know, so it's you know all, all the signs are kind of uh, are kind of pointing to like this. This is a pretty good video. You can kind of see. It used to yeah. be gold, right? You know, around World War Two. And then, right. you know, we started printing currency in order to do guns and butter and Vietnam, et cetera. And we dollarized the world. And by 1971, we took over in terms of, you know, what is the reserve currency that dominates most things? It right. fluctuated a bit there in 1980 because the price level of gold got so high that, you know, central bank gold reserves. Eight, yeah, so high. 880. 880 yeah. on the Russian invasion of Afghanistan. Right. And so, so yeah, so we're sitting in a situation now where look, look at the size in terms of where on balance sheets of central banks, like watch, watch the end of this video. It doesn't fluctuate all that much anymore. I mean, you have a situation now where the U.S. dollar is roughly, I don't know, 55, 50% of uh, balance sheets. Gold is, let me get to that and just pause it so people can kind of understand this. Yeah. All right. So 2020, right before COVID, it's, it's just about half of all the reserves in the world are U.S. dollars. And as right. you know, you know, they'll tell you, Russia, you can't use U.S. dollars anymore. So <laughs> there goes half your balance sheet. Right. I mean, that's the kind of risk that some of these central banks are looking at. And so, of course, they're going to they're going to move into other into other things such as gold uh, because they can own it and have no counterparty risk. And, you know, they can't be iced out. Uh, and then as well, they're looking around and they're thinking, well, look, bonds have performed some of the worst in the last year or two that they've done in history. And then what yeah. else? We have other fiat currencies we can hold. Like, like those are your two options. I mean, those are the major three options you got. You got IOU buckets of fiat currencies, fiat currencies themselves and or gold. So, yeah, of course, they're going to be buying more gold. Or Bitcoin? No, I, I look, I, I know that. Go there's ahead. A I, I want to hear it, Tyree. Go ahead. <laughs> I know there's a Bitcoin pump going on right now. I'm still not sure exactly how they're doing it and in what way. My, I don't necessarily think that institutions are going to be going into Bitcoin uh, in the large scale. You know, there was a there was a little bit of institutional buying last pump in, in Bitcoin, but I'm still under the under the impression that there's going to be a major scandal when it's all said and done, and something like Tether is going to come untethered, and we're going to learn the fact that oh yeah, it was a massive wash trade with a lot of people who were kind of on the inside understanding how that worked and took advantage of it. And then there's a huge, huge the majority of the people in that trade had no clue that a lot of the price discovery was fraudulent. So I, I still, 
I still it could repump. It could you could see it go to 30, 40. I think you know the amount of fraud that we've seen in this market's the last dozen years. Nothing surprises me anymore. But ultimately, yeah. I think in the next few years there's going to be a huge collapse, and it's not just Bitcoin that's going to get going to get smothered and go down to find actual price discovery without leverage and, and fake uh, stable coin pumping. Um, you're going to have a situation where majority of anything crypto is gone, dead. And so the only ones that are going to survive are the ones that actually have any type of utility or value that can serve humanity. And that's a small amount of them compared to the majority of them. All right, let me ask you this. Uh, when do you think they're going to introduce the CBDC here in the U.S.? In the United States? Well, Europe's, okay. Europe's going to be first, it seems. And the CBDC okay. for the United States, I would think it's, you know, it's 2023, 2024. The latter half of 2024 is probably when the launch will occur. Um, wow. Yeah. I mean, I've seen, I've seen some timelines where it looks like the euro would be up by then fully by 2024. The euro, I think, yeah. is trying to be introduced by the end of this year. Right. So I, I would imagine we'll be a year off their pace. So what do you what do you have to say to people that say, well, they know everything anyway. So, you know, they're they they don't really, you know, aren't big believers that it's also a control and surveillance mechanism. Um, you know, it doesn't matter to me. Like if that's your. Yeah, because you're your argument. Well, I'm, like, I'm talking about your American audience. Well, the American the audience should be con should be concerned because the unit of value that's using uh, that's that's underlying it is going to be devaluing hugely, <laughs> because they okay. have unprecedented amounts of debt and unfunded promise piles that are coming due this decade and the next, and math the math doesn't work. You know, you have a GDP yeah. of what versus how much debt versus how many liabilities yeah. that are coming legally due that you cannot default on. How do you pay them? You print the currency. You create the currency. And so, yeah, so if you don't have a job or at least you get $2,000 a month so you don't go ride in the street, that's essentially what the CBD secret is about. It's about a tool of control and a tool of keeping things in line so they can keep building their system. I mean, the, the CBDC is exactly what they're going for. I'm not necessarily convinced it's going to work completely, but it will work when they tell everyone, hey, you're getting to your $2,000 a month stipend is coming through this portal on your smartphone. Yeah. 99% of people are going to take that money and just use it and then okay you know so it's an them... mmt uh um yeah. proxy all right i think so. i think that's instead how of getting people. checks like they did during covid uh, now you're talking about instant money imagine covid but having on a monthly monthly month to month basis like it, that will be the norm 5 years from now i'm pretty pretty convinced because you're going to have so much inflation that the only way to keep up and keep people you know from not I'm riding, riding. Yeah, exactly. So you've got to have, you know, your your first of the month check. You know, you remember that old Bone Thugs and Harmony song, first of the month? It'll be something like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You pick up your smartphone and you start singing Bone Thugs. Yeah. And that's basically what, what happens. You get your $2,000 check and you go to Walmart. Yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah. I tell you, it's amazing how right uh, Orwell and I forgot who the other guy was. That yeah, uh, wrote about a, dystopia, huh? A lot, a lot of great uh, dystopian books, but none of them have n n nothing ever comes true, n comes as good as the reality. Like the the details, the fine details of reality, are so yeah. you couldn't imagine. It. I don't care how creative you are. Okay, so uh, James, uh, uh, how's it going oh, on the physical? No, go ahead. Before we get into the physical front, I'm going to get in the physical front on eggs. See, this is why the arbitrage yeah. of living in Panama and I and having roosters outside works because mine does it at 98. Wow. <laughs> is that higher, though, than it was a year ago? Even mm, there? I mean, they, they may have been like 160 at the lowest when I first okay. got here. You know? Yeah. But, yeah. So but this is but this is at the most expensive supermarket. Like if I went around and bought them actually like from like the guys who raise them in their backyard, I'm sure you get them for cheaper if I tried. But. Uh, I'm coming. Yeah. Up, I'm coming down for an omelet because I can't afford one here. Oh, so, uh, come on down. Yeah. Oh man. All right. So yeah. So your cost of living's better. Everything. So uh, yeah. yeah. Why don't we talk about can people get uh, U.S. Uh, silver coins pre sixty five or are they still on back order? Sure. Let's talk about premiums. I had a chart about premiums here. One sec. Pull that up so people. Because a lot of times in the last few years, premiums got so jacked up, they were yeah. literally 
They were literally. You needed back a like, double. You needed a double in the price of silver to cover the. Yeah, in yeah, and it was out. ridiculous. So I, yeah. and for people who were shrewd and, and just stuck their money in derivatives, I understand, you know, because the premiums were ridiculous. Um, this is the most ridiculous one, which is the Silver Eagle, and it's yeah. become almost collectible because the U.S. Mint is dysfunctional. But in right. the 2008 global financial crisis, when I started in this industry and kind of cut my teeth. Uh, this is what the trial through fire, this was my training was actually some, you know, banks are collapsing. People are calling you on the phone and, you know, they'll, yeah. they'll buy gold and silver at virtually any price because they don't care. They just want to save that, that, that true fear, uh, stuck with me. I, I knew that, okay. So they papered it over in 2008 and 2010. Yeah. That's coming back at some point it's come back, but in, not yet. These are not banks failing. This is just the COVID sh shortage and shutdown and crisis and, burr and all the currency creation etc cetera, etc cetera, and the inflation that followed this uh is kind of uh depending well it's a combination of a few things the silver eagles premium more or less leads the market 90 percent silver the old pre-1964 coins that also is a really important bellwether in terms of premiums well they both went to levels that were higher and longer than the 2008 financial crisis yeah and so that that was it was unprecedented and so uh so this entire time like Buying bullion was a ridiculous uh, proposition because the premiums were just getting so high on so many different products that it was hard to rationalize because you had to make a huge gain in the spot price in order to recoup your, your purchase loss. So uh, right. that's the point I was talking about. But here's the other point. I hear a lot of people who constantly think that well, just because the spot price is going to be going up, that premiums will keep going up, you'll never recoup or this or that. Well, look what happened in 2008 when we went off these, these peak banks are failing premiums we went down to a level that didn't bottom until the actual peak in the spot price of silver so there was a run when the qe yeah. you know the qe and the first versions of qe really began from uh early 2009 all the way till the peak of silver i mean you had nothing more or less than premiums going down and so you can see the blue line and the gray line tighten up as the the premiums on a percentage basis tightened up because the spot the underlying was getting so much higher uh, so it doesn't necessarily mean if you have a if you have a climbing bullion market, what you're going to end up having is it shrink down. The premiums will shrink a lot more because, you know, obviously the spot price doubles. Uh, the percentage that you can allow that that you that you're charging over the over the spot price is going to probably have because there's, there's only so many new buyers in the market and entrants who are willing to buy at those higher spot prices versus how many are possibly selling, etc. So you're making a market and, and the premiums just get more competitive. So. This area right here where we've been in, this is not going yeah. to last. This is going to tighten as we go up higher in spot price over time. And so this is not going to be the norm for the industry. There will be times maybe of panic when there's deflation or some type of other bank issue where that could occur again, where there's overwhelming yeah. demand and the amount of inventory just gets overrun in their industry. But this is not going to be the norm, you know, for the next five years. I, I don't think. I think we'll see a tightening and it'll be more along these lines in terms of, you know, where we are in the future. I have one question from a viewer. Do you think physical trusts work? Physical trusts. Uh, yeah. I mean, if you're going into a trust like an ETF, uh, like an ETF, for, for instance, Sprott's PHYS, that's a pretty good one. I think uh, they Sprott has, what else? They have a silver one. It's called uh, PSLV. Those are, those are good. I think I own a few shares of PSLV. I mean, it's, it's a good trust in the sense that they do buy what they what they state they they they, they purchase. They go out on the market and actually buy the stuff. If you look at uh, for instance, the prospectus of SLV, they changed that prospectus in the quarter one of 2021, uh, when the Wall Street silver Reddit squeeze phenomenon was happening. When we had a run toward 30 an ounce, yeah. and CFTC yeah. was freaking out, and C and the Comex was raising margins like crazy after one after another to try and get the momentum longs out of there. I mean yeah. that. That was a real scare for them because they knew if you get beyond 30, you'll get to quit. You can get to 50 real quick. So they were they were freaked out at that moment. And and SLV at the time saw how, how how overwhelming the amount of demand for physical was. And they know that if the prospectus says that if they have capital inflows, they have to go out and buy a thousand ounce bars. Well, they changed that. They say, well, if the circumstances are such that we can't get thousand ounce bars, we're not going to go out to the market and try and find thousand ounce bars. Good luck. So you guys, you know, you got to. Yeah. You got a 70 page prospectus or 50 page prospectus with all types of writing that says uh, we can fail and it's all your 
It's all your bag on secured shareholder. Yeah. And oh, by the way, we don't have to go out and buy the bars, you know. So SLV okay. is probably the worst thing you can purchase in terms of a market making mechanism in this industry. Okay, well, uh, you know, if you listen to this over the last 25 minutes, you know that James knows. So it's important if you're this is your arena or you have uh, an interest in it from physical to central banks, everything gold and silver. James, your go to guy. So, hey, James, it, best, it, go ahead. Yeah, real quick, make sure people look at the Japanese, the Japanese yen's yeah. gold price. You know, okay. every week we're getting a record price here. And that, yeah. that old 1980 high in silver, you still got a four multiple just to get back to the 1980 high. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. silver silver's dirt cheap, and this chart shows you. I mean, you're talking about one of the biggest reserve currencies in the world, and look how cheap it still is in that, in that currency. Yeah. Wow. Great point on the end as well. So you mm -hmm. find them on on Twitter. And you, uh, yeah, you Twitter, can find them. Go ahead, James. Yeah. Twitter, uh, I'm on Twitter at James Henry Ann right here. And then as well uh, on YouTube, I do a, uh, a weekly market update videos uh, about the bullion market uh, or SD bullion. So just search SD bullion YouTube and you can find our uh, videos. Last week was a pretty good one. It got almost 70,000 views. So uh, the algorithm liked that one. Nice, James. Congratulations. Yeah. And uh, uh, Paul Landon wants to come down and play golf with you. So uh, oh, all right. Great. There's two courses. Uh, two London courses guy. down here. Yeah, yeah give me a shout. Guy. All right, nice. James, thanks so much, buddy. Really appreciate all, right. uh, all your insights. I learn from you every time we talk. Every time. <laughs> that's you, good, James. Dale, because that's coming from an experienced guy. So I appreciate that. You know, keep an open mind. It'll keep your account open. <laughs> good call. All right, buddy. So James, right, Hen James Henry Anderson, everybody. Thank you, James. And uh, you could join the team in 15 minutes on the morning edge. Uh, we'll see everyone for the NFP tomorrow. And good hunting the rest of the day. Don't just count your pips, your coins, your bars. Count your blessings. Adios. Hey, traders. This is Blake Morrow with Forex Analytics. Thanks for stopping by our YouTube channel. Don't forget to like these videos, share them, and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any of the content that we provide here for free. Thanks for stopping by. I'll see you in the next video.